think I dropped something. Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Today is a special day. We come together every year to celebrate um, Dr. Neustadt, who I'm going to talk to you a little bit about in a minute. But before that, I want to thank those of you who joined me at my house on Tuesday night. We had the students there. Uh, the fourth year students came to uh, say hello. We, we usually time this with the uh, training team to, so that, to remind them that this is a good place to come. I always tell them that if they think I'm trying to bribe them to match with us, the answer is yes. Good organizations want to keep the best in-house. And uh, we had a great time. We had about 50 people there. Uh, so it's, it's, that activity is growing, and so is the, uh, the number of people who are, who are stellar in our organization and, and go to fellowships or primary care and do a great job at it. On this day, back in 1766, 1766, February 13, was the birth of Thomas Robert Malthus, M-A-L-T-H-U-S. Now, he's an English economist and demographer who many people think is the pioneer of sociology. And he was the first to really systematically analyze human society. And he come with this, came with this idea that population would always outrun the food supply. And that when it outrun the food supply, then you created diseases and war and famine, so the population will go down, and then the whole cycle will start again. Mm -hmm. And he was around, uh, and he observed that the, during the Industrial Revolution, the number of people, the population was increasing, and he felt very strongly that to sustain a certain reasonable social conditions, you had to somehow control reproduction. Okay? And you may say, well, how does that relate to medicine and biology and us today? Well, there was a young man some years later reading this book called The Assay on the Principle of Population, written by Malthus. His name was Charles Darwin. And this idea influenced him greatly about this concept of survival of the fittest and the process of natural selection and the evolving of populations uh, for any organism. Uh, by the way, Charles Darwin was born yesterday, February 12th, on 1809. So you never know how someone can influence somebody many years later. And so we come every Thursday to talk about some people who have influenced us, even though they may have lived hundred years, hundreds of years ago. And today we have the fortune of actually having someone who's here. So we rarely have, and I'm sure for the students, it's always nice to hear about these people who lived in the 1700s, but it doesn't quite make sense to them. It doesn't quite touch them. Well, here we have an opportunity to touch somebody who's actually influenced Louisville Medicine and the University of Louisville, because our honoree and the people we celebrate today is sitting right here in this audience who's a member of the rheumatology division. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. David Neustadt, who was born in Evansville, Indiana, went to DePaul University in the 1940s, and in 1950 obtained his medical degree from the University of Louisville. He went on to do residency in internal medicine in New York, and in 52 to 53, he was a fellow at the National Institute of Arthritis Metabolism. And then, from 53 to 54, he did a residency in gastroenterology. I don't know whatever possessed him to do this, but I'll learn someday. But he has specialized in arthritis and rheumatoid disorders in Louisville since 1954. A lot of people who have been touched from students to patients to leadership here from his efforts. He was chief of the section of rheumatology from 60 to 1975. He was a chairman of the Department of Medicine at Jewish Hospital and became president of the Jewish Hospital medical staff. He was a fellow of the American College of Physicians and of the American College of Rheumatology. He was a member of the Board of Governors of the National Arthritis Foundation, president of the Louisville Society for Internal Medicine, president of the American Rheumatology Association, and member of the Board of Directors of the Louisville Foundation. And I could continue, but I will leave it at that. Now, we're not the only ones who honor Dr. Neustadt. He's received the Distinguished Service Award from the Arthritis and Rheumatology Foundation. He's a master of the American College of Rheumatology. He's received the Distinguished Rheumatology Award from the same organization, and as well as the Tribute to Excellence Award from the Arthritis Foundation. So it is for this reason that you see that face up there, and it is for this reason that we're proud to have this man sitting in our audience. And because of this, we bring great people every year 
to tell us about what they're learning and how this legacy continues in the area of rheumatology. And we have a great one today, and I'll have Dr. Neil Roberts introduce our guests today. Hi, it's a, a very great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Richard Brasington, Rick Brasington, who is a longtime program director of rheumatology at Wash U. He's here because he's an ACE teacher, and we need to increase the quality of lectures in the new stat lecture from last year, which I admit was rather dry and everything. <laughs> this is, this is uh, somebody who won the Teacher of the Year Award at Wash U four years, two or three running, as late as 19... As late as 2010, and I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. It, it takes a bit to win that, right? It's a medical school wide, all the departments, all the divisions. He won it four times, so he's a really great teacher, and that's you know perhaps similar to Dr. Neustadt himself. In addition to that, he has a couple of subjects under his belt which are of particular importance here. One of them is uh, he is the speaker at the American College of Rheumatology often on pulmonary diseases, interstitial lung disease that goes with uh, rheumatic diseases. We have a particular interest in that. It may be that Dr. Roman secretly thinks he knows what there is to know from WashU on interstitial lung diseases, but he also is an expert, but well, one time probably the world's expert on stopping uh, uh, financial losses from clinical operations in rheumatology and probably has seen it. So that will interest Dr. Roman, I think. Uh, and he also is uh, something like the Dr. Casper of program directors in rheumatology. He's the person who s quietly says in the meeting something that has great common sense value and reduces panic as people are trying to deal with RRC requirements. This is a role that he inherited from one of his mentors, but he is the person in the United States for that particular thing, which is really critical because, as you probably know, the RRC is not really a closed loop. So he's very important in that way. And uh, I will skip over the detailed CV, but just mention uh, it goes North Carolina, Harvard, Duke, Iowa, Iowa, chief president in Iowa, 10 years of private practice basically at Marshfield Clinic associated with uh, University of Wisconsin, where one of his teachers in uh, workflow and that kind of thing was uh, Tim Harrington, a student of uh, Dr. Neustadt. So here's Rick Brasington. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a tremendous honor to be here as the Neustadt lecturer. Uh, and I will let it go at that before I start blubbering. Um, and it's great to see Neil again. Neil was actually my intern when I was a brand new medical student on medicine. And um, I, I actually tell the story that one day I went home crying to my wife. I said, this is too hard. I just can't do it. Um, and uh, Neil was there to uh, rescue me. So my title is a little bit pompous, uh, The Treatment of Rheumatoid Arthritis in 2014, A Triumph of Translational Medicine. But what we've been able to do in rheumatoid arthritis really is a good example of translational medicine. And fortunately, we've been very successful. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my history. Um, there, there was a Dr. Brasington before me. Ernest Custine Brasington was born in 1860 in South Carolina. He was actually the grandson of William Figures Brasington, who was the first Brasington to come to uh, the United States. And uh, so William Figures Brasington's son, George Cawthon Brasington, died of wounds suffered in the Battle of Gettysburg, where he served in the Palmetto Regiment of the South Carolina Infantry. Um, Ernest Custine was anxious for an education. However, his father having been killed during the Civil War, it was rather difficult for him to accomplish this. But with his great determination, he succeeded. And he took up the study of medicine in 1886 at the Kentucky School of Medicine and graduated from that school and then practiced at a gold mine in South Carolina. I don't know the rest of the story, but um, anyway, my great-grandfather, 
who was his cousin, Samuel Furman Brasington, also attended the Kentucky School of Medicine, graduating in 1897. He practiced in Camden, South Carolina. He actually served one term in the South Carolina Senate. Um, uh, here is uh, Samuel Furman Brasington, a, a pretty dashing guy. Now, what's interesting is that the Kentucky School of Medicine was absorbed by the University of Louisville in 1908. So my great-grandfather and his cousin actually have uh, an indirect connection to this School of Medicine. So my disclosures are that I currently speak for Pfizer, uh, and I am not currently doing any of these clinical trials, but I did participate in clinical trials about a number of the uh, medicines we're going to talk about. So my objectives today are to understand the huge change in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, which has occurred over the last three dec decades, understand a hypothesis-driven approach to identifying targets for new medications, recognize the particular toxicities which can occur with these new medications, and to understand that the future of development of new therapies is exciting. So Neil explained that I needed to begin with a case. So a 63-year-old married white female developed a febrile illness, following which she developed polyarticular joint pain, morning stiffness, and fatigue. Her husband, who happened to be a rheumatologist, suggested that she had rheumatoid arthritis. Based on the physical findings of synovial proliferation of the second and third metacarpal phalangeal joints and proximal interphalangeal joints bilaterally. Uh, the patient saw her internist, also a rheumatologist, who diagnosed viral arthritis and ordered no studies. Her joint pain persisted, partially relieved by psilococcib, which she had been taking for osteoarthritis, the hands and feet. Three months later, she went back to her internist rheumatologist, who now suspected rheumatoid arthritis because of the prominence of the ulnar styloids, uh, ordered rheumatoid factor, sedimentation rate, C-reactive protein, um, no further tests, um, and then ordered an MRI of the hands. This was interpreted by the chief of musculoskeletal radiology as showing erosions consistent with RA, but these might just be normal erosions. I was too embarrassed to ask what a normal erosion was, but... Um, Anyway, uh, her diagnosis uh, was made as rheumatoid arthritis, and methotrexate and low-dose prednisone were started, and her husband, while relieved, felt like hitting himself in the head with a Louisville slugger. <laughs> so here she is. Uh, you can actually see uh, in this photograph that she does have uh, swelling of, her, of her, uh, the small joints in her hand. Um, so rheumatoid arthritis is a very common condition. It affects about 1% of the population. There's probably somebody in the room today who has it. Uh, it tends to affect women more than men. Uh, peak incidence in the middle years. And characterized by this symmetric synovitis, joint erosions, and a number of extra articular manifestations that we won't really talk about today. So the pathology of rheumatoid arthritis is basically that of synovial proliferation. The normal synovium is only one or two cell layers thick. And for a variety of reasons in rheumatoid arthritis, the synovium proliferates to many cell layers thick and develops lots of new blood vessels and is infiltrated with lymphocytes. And the activated effector cells within this proliferating synovium include osteoclasts, which degrade the underlying bone, producing these erosions, and joint space narrowing. Now, this is what normal synovium looks like, a very delicate tissue, uh, lots of adipose tissue, not much in the way of inflammatory cells. And here's rheumatoid synovium, thickened uh, lining layer, many, many blood vessels, and lots and lots of activated lymphocytes. Uh, grossly, it has these fronds, and under the microscope, you might mistake it for a lymphoid organ because it has these uh, areas that look very much like lymphoid follicles. It's characterized by swelling of the small joints of the hand, and for some reason it tends to be the second and third MCPs and PIPs. And if you were to feel this person's um, knuckles, uh, unlike the bony enlargement that I have in my osteoarthritic knuckles, you would feel something uh, that gives. It has kind of a squishy or boggy feeling. The hands are always involved in rheumatoid arthritis, especially the MCP, the metacarpophalangeal, and the proximal interphalangeal joints, and the MTP joints in the feet are also involved, and it's in the hands and feet where we see the most uh, abnormalities. What happens is that the rheumatoid synovium grows out of control. It wraps around the bone and cartilage uh, as a panis. Panis is the Latin word for cloth. 
and this panis wraps around the bone and cartilage and produces a great deal of damage. Uh, and so you can see here that the, where the synovium should be limited in its distribution, it's, it's growing like crazy. And so this produces this considerable damage. Uh, this, is, this is an early erosion here, uh, but you can see very advanced damage occurs if the disease goes untreated. Uh, this leads to the characteristic uh, ulnar drift or ulnar deviation, severe joint space narrowing. Uh, it can be a very destructive process. This is not a risk that's been operated on. This is simply the collapse of the carpus and the whittling away of the ulnar styloid uh, by the erosive effects of the disease. As I mentioned, you see the changes primarily in the hands. You can see here that this finger has actually subluxed. Uh, it's no longer connected to this metacarpal. The same sort of process uh, happens in the feet. So in 1982, when I was a first year fellow, uh, we were taught that uh, something very, very different than what we believe now. We were taught that we should not start a second year, uh, a, uh, sorry, we should not start a second line agent until the patient had had rheumatoid arthritis for at least a year because the disease might go away. Uh, and we believed with some justification that the treatments were worse than the disease. The number one treatment was injectable gold. It required an IM injection every week before which the patient had, a, had to have a blood count and a urinalysis to make sure that they didn't have aplastic anemia or nephrotic syndrome, which developed with some frequency. Our number two drug was D-penicillamine, which we don't use anymore. The number three drug was azathioprine. And uh, finally, there was sulfasalazine and Plaquenil, which most people thought it didn't really work very well. Uh, Dan First, one of my teachers, was one of the pioneers in using methotrexate. Uh, we all thought he was crazy. Uh, we thought this was a radical option. The patients had to be admitted to the clinical research center. They had a baseline liver biopsy and a liver biopsy every six months. And uh, it was hard for us to believe that this would actually become the standard treatment. By 1986, when I started my first job, uh, we actually had discussions about whether it was reasonable to start methotrexate even if a patient had not failed injectable gold. Now, we can't really get injectable gold anymore, or we probably would still use it. But we weren't doing very well. About half of our patients at the five-year point were disabled. The big news then was that an oral form of gold was coming along, uh, which never really made a big splash. And we began to recognize that stage four rheumatoid arthritis has the same mortality curve as three-vessel coronary disease. By the time I started at Washington University, not quite 20 years ago, people were beginning to think maybe our treatments were not working because we weren't starting them early enough. And we developed the current concept of starting these medicines at the time of diagnosis and often in combination. So here is this old survival curve uh, showing uh, what, what you could expect if you had very severe um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see that the survival curve was not too different than what you would have for uh, severe coronary artery disease. So that was the first time that we began to recognize that having rheumatoid arthritis was not only disabling, it was really a threat to your life. And furthermore, we recognized that over time, uh, even though the inflammation might remain fairly steady, the incidence of disability increased and the evidence of damage on radiographs increased in a fairly linear fashion. So we needed to do something different. So in 1998, that's the beginning of what I call the golden age in rheumatology. In three months, uh, three important medicines came out. Well, two important medicines, uh, leflunamide, uh, brand name Areva was released, and it's an oral DMARD with efficacy comparable to methotrexate, which at the time should have been a big deal. But the following month, a drug called Enbrel was improved, uh, approved as the first biologic drug. And uh, this really was uh, quite exciting. Uh, and then the following month, uh, Celebrex or Celecoxib approved, was approved, and we, we thought at that time it was really going to be the end of, of non GI toxicity as we know it. Uh, that part turned out not to be true. So we now have this group of disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, or DMARDs, um, in um, oral form uh, that we uh, use. 
But the major therapeutic advance in the last two decades has been developing therapies that target individual molecules. Virtually all of these treatments uh, are fairly nonspecific uh, in their mechanism of action. And for some of them, quite honestly, we don't really know why they work. They were discovered accidentally. Gold, for example, is an old treatment for infectious disease, and it was just stumbled upon that people with rheumatoid arthritis got better. So uh, every lecture on rheumatoid arthritis has to have an incomprehensible slide with uh, a lot of cells and a lot of arrows. <clears throat> but there are really two points that this slide makes. One is that we know that a lot of different cells in the immune system work together to produce the phenotype that we know as rheumatoid arthritis. And the other thing that's very important is these cells communicate with one another by sending various molecular signals. So as scientists have developed better ideas about what's going on in the rheumatoid process, we have been able to better identify targets for the treatments. And that's basically what I'm going to tell you about. So four molecular targets that have been uh, exploited are tumor necrosis factor alpha, uh, a surface protein called CTLA-4 on the T cell, CD20 on the B cell, and the cytokine IL-6. So the TNF story is actually fairly simple. TNF is a trimeric molecule. It's a member of the uh, TNF superfamily. It is secreted. And when it finds uh, its specific receptor on a target cell, if it is able to cross-link the receptor, it sends a transmembrane signal to the nucleus, and the nucleus starts making proteins. So it was recognized that TNF was overexpressed in some animal models of rheumatoid arthritis. There is a naturally occurring inhibitor, the soluble TNF receptor. And if this binds to TNF before it gets to the receptor, it ties it up so it can't bind. So a very clever strategy was um, pursued, which involved fusing the gene for IgG1 and the gene for one of the TNF receptors uh, into a fusion protein. It, it structurally resembles an antibody, but, it, but it's not. Uh, and this is called etanercept. Anything that ends with sept somehow exploits a receptor. And so when etanercept is given, it binds the TNF so that the TNF can't get to the receptor. When it first came out, people said, well, this is an injection. Rheumatoid arthritis patients aren't going to be willing to give themselves an injection. It's too expensive. And by the second year it was out, uh, the demand for it was so high that the company had to stop offering new prescriptions and limit its production to the people that were already on the drug until they could build a new uh, bioreactor. So back to our patient. She was on methotrexate for three months. Her disease remained quite active. And she was started on this drug, uh, 50 milligrams a week, and did very well. So the other strategies for targeting TNF have been antibody-based. And just to briefly remind you about antibody structure, uh, there is a constant region and a variable region. Uh, and uh, so there is a, a terminology for monoclonal antibodies that you may be aware of, uh, but it's Ix, Zu, and Mu. So Ix, as in infliximab, is a chimeric antibody. And so that means it's derived from a mouse, generally. And then the gene is mutated so that only the variable region of the immunoglobulin is of murine origin. So it's X like a, a crossover car. Zu means it's humanized, derived from a mouse. But the gene for the antibody is mutated so that only the complementarity determining region, or the CDR, is of murine origin. And then mu is a fully human antibody. So uh, just diagrammatically, here's a chimeric antibody. The gene for the constant region has been replaced with human sequences. So only this part of the antibody is derived from mouse uh, genes. Uh, here is just the complementarity determining region and a humanized antibody and then a human antibody. So the chimera, of course, uh, is a creature that is a combination of two animals, and, and uh, such is the chimeric antibody. So the first antibody that was developed uh, against TNF was this chimeric antibody um, called infliximab, uh, brand name Remicade. 
And um, so the way it worked was uh, obviously that it was going to bind uh, TNF. And so uh, if the infliximab is given, it binds the TNF before the TNF can bind to the target cell, uh, rendering the TNF inactive. Um, the next strategy was to develop a humanized TNF antibody, and this is sertolizumab. Uh, so it has only the complement, complement, complementarity determining regions or the antigen binding sites, which are of mouse origin. And actually, this is a somewhat different structure. It's just the business end of the antibody, the FAB part of the antibody. It's wrapped up in polyethylene glycol. Uh, gastroenterologists uh, use a, a pegylated product. This is the first uh, such product that rheumatologists have used. Uh, polyethylene glycol is heavily hydrated, so that increases its radius. And more interestingly, inflamed tissue is more permeable uh, and so these pegylated products get into inflamed tissue and stay there a little bit better. Um, so after about 18 months, uh, the patient was no longer helped by uh, etanercept, so she was switched to sertolizumab pegol, brand name Simsia. Uh, that's a typo. It's 200 milligrams every other week, again with excellent results. And because she was starting to lose hair, the methotrexate was stopped. So finally, we come to fully human TNF antibodies. Uh, adalimumab and golimumab. Now, I'll say that even though this sounds like an advance, uh, these drugs don't necessarily work any better than the other drugs, uh, but it seems more fitting to use a TNF antibody. Adalimumab is developed by a very complicated process that I won't try to explain called phage display, where basically you, you, you take cells that might be producing a TNF antibody, and you isolate the cells that produce it by seeing which ones will have the antibody bind on this, this column. But it's a very complicated process and <clears throat> not something we should go into right now. So the first human antibody was adalimumab, which came to be known as uh, Humira. And then another very clever strategy was developed with some transgenic mice. So obviously, if you inject a normal mice with TNF, it's going to make um, a mouse antibody to human TNF. However, if you suppress the mouse antibody genes and put in human antibody genes instead, and then inject the mouse with human TNF, it will make a human antibody. And so that's how uh, golimumab, or the uh, monoclonal antibody symphony, is made. So we now have um, five anti-TNF agents that we can use uh, in rheumatoid arthritis. So after another 18 months, sertolizumab pegol stopped working, and the patient was then switched to adalimumab, uh, Humira, 40 milligrams every other week, and this worked as well. So um, we've talked about how there are a number of places where we can target and intervene. So here is TNF, which we have managed to block so that it doesn't reach the target cell. And the next strategy involves something called co-stimulation. And because this is a good picture, I'll start here. So T cells have a specific receptor for whichever antigen they're going to recognize. The antigen is presented by what's called an antigen presenting cell. And that is the first signal. But when the first signal occurs, that's not enough. There has to be this second signal, this co-stimulatory signal. So the T cell has on its surface a protein called CD28. And the antigen presenting cell has CD8086. And so this binding has to occur as the second signal or the co-stimulating uh, signal. Apologize, I'm a little bit out of order. Let me just comment on the effectiveness of these new medications. This really applies to the other medicines I'm going to talk about, uh, but this really first became apparent um, with these new medicines. So um, ACR stands for American College of Rheumatology, and an ACR 50 means the patient got at least 50% better by an outcome measure that I won't bore you with. Uh, but you can see uh, in, in this study of people with fairly early rheumatoid arthritis uh, that about half 
the people got at least 50% better if they were treated either with methotrexate or etanercept, the first TNF uh, uh, agent, first TNF inhibitor. But when they was, these were combined, uh, an even higher uh, improvement was seen. And 50% of people getting 50% better may not sound very good, but it's a whole lot better than we were doing. And uh, also getting uh, th to the point that maybe 25% of people will get almost completely better uh, is, it has been big progress. Not only that, we have been able to demonstrate that these agents actually prevent damage to the joint. So uh, Dr. Sharp uh, identified or set up a scoring system where 40 joints in the hands and feet were evaluated for the development of joint space narrowing, and 44 joints were evaluated for erosions. And so you can actually count up a, a score. So um, as I mentioned before, if you have untreated disease or unsuccessfully treated disease, this joint erosion score uh, gradually gets worse over time. And so we have been able to show that with these new medications, we can improve that considerably. So here's the study with adalimumab, one of the humanized antibodies. Uh, this is the way the joint damage score went in the patients treated only with methotrexate. Um, compared to adalimumab, and you can see when the adalimumab was added, uh, this flattened out. Now, that's not to say that the only treatments that work are the newer medicines, uh, but they do work quite dramatically. And this has really been shown over and over again for, for virtually all of these medicines uh, that compared to less effective treatments, the joint damage scores are, are much improved. So there is a dark side to TNF blockade. Uh, because there are some problems that occur, and these are things that you should know about, because even if you're not prescribing TNF inhibitors, you'll likely have patients that are taking them. Um, <clears throat> if a patient has latent TB, a TNF inhibitor will allow the TB to become active and maybe even disseminated, because the body uses granulomas to corral the TB, and TNF is very important for the function of the granulomas. So we have to be careful that people do not have um, latent TB. Uh, it was once thought that these drugs would be good for everything, including multiple sclerosis. It turns out they actually make multiple sclerosis worse. Uh, and some patients who are treated with these diseases, uh, these medicines will actually develop a demyelinating syndrome that's somewhat similar to MS. Drug-induced lupus has occurred. And one very important thing you should be aware of is that when people are treated with these TNF inhibitors, about 10% of them will develop not only anti-nuclear antibodies, but antibodies to double-stranded DNA. That can be very confusing if the patient is subsequently evaluated, because we tend to think of antibodies to double-stranded DNA as being very specific for lupus. Cardiologists in the room know that these drugs were once uh, thought to be uh, helpful in congestive heart failure. It turned out they made congestive heart failure worse. And occasionally, uh, patients who do not have congestive heart failure can develop it on these medicines, so we have to be careful about that. There probably is a slightly increased incidence of lymphoma. This is hard to assess because lymphoma is also associated with rheumatoid arthritis. The more severe the rheumatoid arthritis, the more likely you are to have lymphoma. Uh, the more severe the rheumatoid arthritis, the more likely you are to get treated with one of these drugs. So there's a certain amount of uh, of confounding by indication or channeling bias, but um, there probably is a slightly increased risk of lymphoma. So now T cell co stimulation blockade. So this is the idea um, that we might be able to target T cells. It's been known for a long time that most of those lymphocytes I showed you in the synovium are T cells. So it was assumed that a strategy against T cells would be effective, but the previous things that were done uh, toward T cells were not very effective. So I already told you about the first signal being antigen binding by the T cell receptor. The second signal is the binding of CD28 by CD86. And when that happens, uh, all sorts of uh, inflammatory mediators are produced. The T cell becomes activated, et cetera. When this happens, the T cell also displays another protein called uh, uh, well, sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. 
So CD28 is the protein that's on the T cell surface. It's also a member of a immunoglobulin superfamily. It's found on all CD4 cells, and when it is bound, it stimulates the release of IL-2 and promotes T cell survival. But when the T cell is activated, it immediately puts on the brakes and it expresses this protein called cytotoxic T lymphocyte associated antigen 4, or CTLA-4. And this is homologous to CD28, but it's actually much more avid for the co-stimulatory molecule CD8086. And so if CTLA-4 binds this before the CD28 does, then it shuts down activation. So here is the CTLA-4 that's expressed on the T cell. Uh, and so scientists were able to, again, make a fusion protein linking the extra membrane portion of CTLA-4 to the IgG1 molecule, FC fragment, producing CTLA-4 or abatacept. And so this agent then is given parenterally and will bind CD86 before CD28 shutting down T cell activation. So this is another strategy uh, that has proven to be quite effective. Another approach has been the depletion of B lymphocytes, and this is something that was actually discovered by accident. Rituximab has been available as a B cell killer for some time for the treatment of lymphoma. Uh, hematologists recognized that it would help for the treatment of uh, uh, immune thrombocytopenia purpura. Um, and so a rheumatologist who was treating ITP in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, noticed that one of his rheumatoid arthritis patients got dramatically better when they got uh, rituximab. So um, this drug was studied, and it, and it turns out that it works quite well. It's, we, we're not quite sure why it works. Um, B cells not only grow up into plasma cells and make antibody, but they act as antigen-presenting cells, and they themselves produce cytokines. So uh, we don't really understand exactly uh, why this is effective, uh, but we do know that we've got this antibody to CD20. Uh, this is another chimeric antibody uh, with, the, with the X in it. So rituximab binds to the CD20 on the cell surface, uh, and uh, fortunately, it does not kill everything in the B cell line. It kills the activated B cells, the mature B cells, but it leaves alone the little bitty baby B cells, and it leaves alone the plasma cells that produce antibody. So although the circulating peripheral blood B cells are depleted for quite a long period of time. They basically disappear in a couple of weeks and don't come back, don't start to come back for about six months. Uh, the antigen, um, or the antibody producing cells, the plasma cells are still there. There are a couple of toxicities that seem to be unique to rituximab. Uh, one is hypogamma globulinemia, uh, and occasionally this can be significant and produce um, uh, more frequent infections. And there's a very rare infection called progressive multifocal encephalopathy, or PML, which comes from a, a virus called the JC virus. And for reasons which aren't clear, there's something about B cell depletion that increases the risk of this. This has been known for quite a long time in immunosuppressed cancer patients. It's now occurred in a handful of rheumatoid arthritis patients and a handful of lupus patients who have received rituximab. So if your patient has received rituximab and they start to develop neurologic problems, you need to think uh, about this. The other cytokine that has been successfully targeted is interleukin-6. And interleukin-6 does a whole lot of things. It activates monocytes and macrophages. Uh, it activates B cells. Uh, it stimulates the liver to produce C-reactive protein, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we know that in patients with active rheumatoid arthritis, they have a lot more IL-6 than healthy controls. So it seems like an appropriate target. And so now we have another humanized antibody called tocilizumab. So again, the 
All of the antibody is derived from human sequences except the part of the antibody that binds IL-6, and it actually binds the IL-6 receptor. So what happens is that when, um, when IL-6 is coming along uh, to bind to the receptor, first we put the antibody there, and because the antibody has bound to the receptor, uh, then when IL-6 comes, uh, it can't bind. Uh, so, um, another effective treatment. A few toxicities with this medicine that we weren't used to seeing. Um, we can get some transaminase elevation and elevated lipids, and there have been a few cases of colonic perforation. We're not really sure why that's happening. Um, some people have, uh, have uh, speculated that IL-6 may be important in, in GRI repair, but especially if you have somebody with a history of diverticulitis. You want to be very careful about giving uh, this medicine. Uh, I actually participated in a post-marketing study to see how big a problem this was. And wouldn't you know it, the very first patient I gave it to perforated her colon and died. Uh, and it was the only patient <clears throat> in the study that had this happen to. So it, it, it's a rare problem, but it's a, rare pro a, a, a real problem. So if you have a patient with rheumatoid arthritis who's developing abdominal pain and they're on tocilizumab, you really need to be aware of this, um, this problem. So there was one hypothesis that failed, and that was the idea that you could inhibit interleukin-1. Uh, in animal models, interleukin-1 is very important. Uh, this is an interesting strategy taking advantage of a naturally occurring inhibitor called IL-1 receptor antagonist. So this decoy uh, cytokine binds to the IL-1 receptor but does not uh, stimulate a, a transmembrane signal. Um, uh, but unfortunately, it didn't really work very well. Um, so it, it, it's available, but it's only occasionally used. Now, what I've considered the holy grail in drug development has been to come up with a medicine like these biologic DMARDs. They're all proteins, so they can't be ingested. They have to be given parenterally. Uh, they are extremely expensive to make. Uh, the factory looks a little bit like a brewery, uh, except in these giant tanks. They're not making beer. They're, they're growing uh, cells which secrete these antibodies, and that soup has to be purified, et cetera, et cetera. So the goal has been to develop a small molecule or a synthetic molecule in the form of a pill. So that brings us to the story of the JAKs. JAK is short for Janus kinase. Uh, these are what, what are called signaling molecules. They're actually inside the cell. And they are what makes things happen once the cytokine binds to the receptor. So for example, when interleukin-6 binds to its receptor, the receptor has to send a transmembrane signal. And so what happens is the JAK enzymes uh, undergo what's called autophosphorylation, adding a tyrosine residue. And it works very much like the clotting cascade uh, does in hematology, or the complement cascade. So when the, jack, uh, the jacks phosphorylate one another, they then phosphorylate this other group of, uh, of signaling molecules called the stats. The stats go to the nucleus and then stimulate protein production. So this newest medicine called, called toposidinib, IB is for inhibitor, uh, inhibits these uh, JAKs and prevents this. So it has a fairly similar efficacy uh, as the other medicines I've told you about. There are actually a number of JAK inhibitors uh, used in uh, other conditions. Uh, the uh, toposidinib is the first one to be applied to rheumatoid arthritis. So our case uh, continued to have problems because after another 18 months, sertilizumab pegol was no longer effective, and she was then switched to tofacitinib, uh, Zelgans, uh, five milligrams twice a day with good results. Uh, she was able to go on vacation with her husband and uh, is uh, living happily uh, ever after. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to close. Uh, I hope that you have got a better understanding of the fine details of how we have 
come up with strategies to make new treatments. This is, this is obviously a strategy that could be applied to any disease. Uh, and fortunately, in rheumatology, we've just had spectacular success with developing these new drugs for rheumatoid arthritis. There's, these biologic agents are, are specific for individual molecules. Uh, we've used res, uh, monoclonal antibodies, receptor-based fusion proteins, and uh, small molecule inhibitors. And the future of rheumatoid arthritis therapies is very promising. Uh, in Missouri, we actually have some guidance about rheumatoid arthritis. We have, uh, we have a highway in Texas County that's named RA. And uh, with that, I'll close, and I hope you might have some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. I, I, I really appreciate it. You know, one of, the, one of the reasons we bring great speakers here is that they also show us how to deliver a lecture. And notice how he started by telling us a little bit about himself and creating that relationship between him and you, and then moving on to his patient and weaving that story of the patient throughout the presentation and giving us some interesting insights. So thank you for that. Neil told me to do that. Neil told you yeah. to do that. Okay. Good job, Neil. Uh, I had a couple of questions for you, and, and um, one relates to the fact that we see in other conditions where a treatment works, but then after a little while, it sort of goes away. And in fact, you probably schedule her for your visit every 18 months because you know something's going to happen. So I want you to tell us why you think that's getting, uh, she's overcoming the beneficial right. effects of the drugs, right. which has nothing to do with the mechanism because a drug that impacts the same mechanism works. The second thing that I wanted to ask you, that's the only thing I'm gonna ask you so don't worry about too many questions here, but um, you also mentioned that 50% of these people get 50% better, which also suggests that not all these people are TNF-alpha dependent. And it goes back to this concept of we're lumping all these conditions because it makes it easier. We call everybody who has obstruction COPD and we call everybody asthma, but we're learning that everybody is very different. So there may be rheumatoid arthritis that it's TNF-alpha dependent, there may be rheumatoid arthritis that it's interleukin-6 dependent and so forth. So tell me about those, those two things if you can. Yeah, it's a very interesting point and a great question. So rheumatoid arthritis is a phenotype. Uh, my boss, John Atkinson, has helped me understand that most rheumatic conditions are really syndromes. Uh, it's a collection of signs and symptoms that we can recognize and call something. Uh, it, it is not really a disease process that we understand. It's not like uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency where you know the absence of that protein is the cause of the disorder. Uh, and the name rheumatoid arthritis is very illustrative. What the heck does rheumatoid mean anyway? So um, it, there is a long history of lumping everything under rheumatoid arthritis, uh, what we now call the spondyloarthropathies were once called the seronegative rheumatoid variants. It was thought that ankylosing spondylitis was a variant of rheumatoid arthritis. Now we know it is a disease with an entirely distinct genetic basis and pathophysiology. Juvenile arthritis, what's once called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, all lumped together. So. I believe that what we're now calling rheumatoid arthritis probably is a family of disorders that have a similar phenotype. In some people, it's probably driven by TNF-alpha. In some people, it's driven by IL-6. In some people, it's driven by T-cell hyperactivity. In some people, it's driven by B-cell hyperactivity and probably a bunch of other mechanisms we haven't yet figured out. And it's probably not only one mechanism. So that's why I think a patient who doesn't respond to a TNF-alpha inhibitor might then respond to interleukin-6 blockade or T-cell co-stimulation blockade. Unfortunately, despite a lot of interest in this, nobody's been able to figure out how to subtype those patients. The obvious thing to do would be to try to identify the patient in advance so that we knew which drug to give them. Uh, it would be as if somebody had sepsis and you said, well, you know what? We, we know you have an infection. We have no idea which antibody is going to work. We're going to give you this antibody, and if it doesn't work, then after a few weeks, we'll give you another one. Well, that's what we're doing, except we're giving agents that cost three or $4,000 a month, 
three months and say, well, that one didn't work. I guess we'll try something else. It's, it's really quite humbling. So, we, so undoubtedly there are different subtypes within the phenotype of what we call rheumatoid arthritis. The question of why an agent stops working uh, is very puzzling. Um, I think there are a couple of possibilities. One is it would make sense that the immune system would be very redundant. If one arm of the immune system isn't working, you'd hope that some other arm would take care of you so you don't die of infection. So it may be that if you block TNF-alpha, something else takes over. The other possibility, which, which is probably makes a little bit more sense, is all of these are foreign proteins. Even the ones that are fully human are not naturally occurring proteins, and we know that the body reacts to them. It's been especially shown with um, infliximab, Remicade, that patients make antibodies to the drug. And to the extent that patients make antibodies, sometimes this will clear the drug from the circulation. So it might be that people are, um, are developing neutralizing antibodies that take the agent out of the system before it manages to bind. Now, why you can use one TNF inhibitor that, it, we, the first three drugs that came out were TNF inhibitors. So if one didn't work, we try the other and then try the other. Why one TNF inhibitor won't work and then another one will, no one's been able to explain. We know that the TNF antibodies work in Crohn's disease. The fusion protein, uh, Tantercept, does not. So that's led to lots of speculation about Maybe an antibody does something that a fusion protein doesn't do, yet sertolizumab, which doesn't have an FC receptor, it's just the FAB fragment wrapped up in polyethylene glycol, does work for Crohn's disease. So there's a lot about this that, that we just don't understand. Thank you. Questions? Can you repeat a short version of that? Yeah, so two questions. Uh, one was the comment that, that methotrexate was the first drug he had seen where you didn't need a statistician to tell you that it helped. And the second was, what is the role of corticosteroids? Uh, what I didn't mention <clears throat> is that uh, in the 90s, when we started testing these drugs, that was really the beginning of really effective clinical trials in rheumatology because prior to that point, it was very hard to distinguish a placebo response from a real response. And as you mentioned, there really was never a good study showing that injectable gold worked. And there was a lot of debate about that. Um, the newer medicines are so effective that the doctor enrolling the patient in the trial uh, cannot be the one doing the efficacy evaluation because sometimes the patients improve so dramatically that the joint count uh, changes so quickly that the blind is broken for both the doctor uh, and the patient. Uh, the ophthalmologists don't refer to blinded trials, by the way. They, re they, refer, to them, they refer to them as shielded. Um, so that's one issue. The, the story behind prednisone is very interesting. I had a chance to attend the lecture of uh, Kaylor Hench, who is the son of Philip Hench, who, who told about going to... Um, uh, Stockholm for his dad to get the Nobel Prize, which is quite something. Uh, but the story that I didn't know was about the first patient treated with corticosteroids. Uh, at the Mayo Clinic, they had identified some time ago that a woman during pregnancy got dramatically better. And they spent a lot of time trying to figure out why that was. To this day, we don't really know. But they said, you know, this might have something to do with a hormone. So they kind of filed that away. And then when Philip Hench got his hands on some cortisone, they went and got that patient who had gotten better during pregnancy. They gave her the prednisone, 
And the legend goes that she went from being bedridden to uh, dancing at a hotel downtown in Rochester in three days. So there's no question that prednisone and other corticosteroids are effective. Uh, they do dramatically improve symptoms. Uh, corticosteroids do not have this disease-modifying effect. And as you point out, there's a lot of toxicity. So we generally uh, reserve prednisone uh, either as an initial therapy or a bridge therapy. Uh, when you get somebody who can't get dressed and can't go to work and, and they can't wait for several weeks or a couple of months for medicine to make them better, uh, get them on methotrexate or one of these newer drugs and then try to get them off of the prednisone. The, the, the problem is that they work and it's hard to take them away. Uh, when I was a student, I was uh, a fourth year student. I spent a couple of months at the NIH and a student and I were talking. We said, well, you know, they teach us that you should never use prednisone in rheumatoid arthritis. Every one of these patients here is on, on prednisone. <laughs> the guy in the back was one of the faculty there, and he said, that's because it's the only thing that works. Um, and that was in 1980. So, uh, so we, we really try not to use prednisone. There, there, there actually is one very interesting study that we don't pay too much attention to. It's the COBRA trial. COBRA stands for something in Dutch that I don't remember. But this was one of the studies that showed that combination agents worked. And so they gave um, high-dose steroids starting at 60 milligrams a day and tapered the patients off over six weeks combination of sulfasalazine, hydroxychloroquine, and methotrexate, and compared, compared this to a control group. What was interesting is five years later, the group that got the steroids for six weeks had a big difference in joint damage. Now, whether that's clinically significant, I don't know. I don't routinely do this. I did treat one patient that way because it was one of those days I said, well, uh, if, if there's this evidence, how come I don't do what the evidence says? And I treated him that way, and he's done great. Uh, so there are actually some um, mavericks who recommend that you give an initial course of steroids uh, because we think it's so important to calm down the disease. But you'd get a lot of argument about that, rheumatologists. Thank you, sir. I drink bourbon, and I haven't gotten rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> we know what you've got. <laughs> well, one, one interesting Could point. Repeat a little bit. Of yeah. It, so people on video yeah, I'm watch. sorry. So the question, the question is, um, Dr. Newsett was referring to the fact that um, a study done a long time ago, uh, one group of rheumatoids was given aspirin, one group was given placebo, and then a year later, you couldn't really tell the difference. Um, we know that if you, if you don't treat rheumatoid arthritis effectively, bad things will happen. So that's led to an attempt at early recognition and early treatment. Uh, the Europeans have been very interested in early arthritis, and uh, they have found that most cases of, quote, early arthritis do not actually turn out to be rheumatoid arthritis. So the new classification criteria that have been developed by the American College of Rheumatology and the European League Against Rheumatism uh, are structured to try to allow earlier diagnosis but uh, not 
overdiagnosis. And so I, I applied this uh, two days ago. One of our senior faculty members has developed pain and swelling in his hands and morning stiffness. Um, and if I were just going by intuition, I'd say, well, you have rheumatoid arthritis. But by the new uh, classification criteria, he doesn't quite make it. So there, there is the challenge of not overdiagnosing what might be a transient problem and putting somebody on medicine that they'd be on for the rest of their lives. I'm not sure if I really answered your question. <laughs> He's not answering. I don't know. Another question. Last question. Great question. So the question is, there's recent data, I assume you're referring to the TIER trial, uh, which stands for the treatment of early aggressive rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and the, so because of this radiographic data, uh, the companies making these medicines did a great job of convincing us, myself included, that these drugs were fundamentally better than methotrexate and the other drug. And uh, a number of people developed the opinion that we should start with these medicines. And so there was a very uh, clever trial design. Uh, a number of the country's leading rheumatologists, uh, led by Jim O'Dell, uh, structured a trial where patients were in four groups. All of them started on methotrexate. One group started on methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, and sulfasalazine, triple therapy. Another group started on methotrexate and etanercept. And then the fourth, so two groups started, one on triple therapy, one on, one on etanercept, and the other groups could be escalated from methotrexate to either etanercept or to triple therapy. Uh, and so what they found was that at the end of two years, there was no difference among the groups. In other words, the group of people that started on a TNF blocker did not do any better than the people who, who were started on triple therapy and stayed on it or started on triple therapy and switched to a Tannercept, suggesting that nothing is lost by starting first with the less expensive oral agents. And so that really is the way I practice. I start with methotrexate, I escalate to a combination of oral agents, and then go to these medicines later. Um, a very important point which I didn't make, was if you look at what's called a probability analysis of the patients in a trial. Let's say you're comparing methotrexate and placebo to methotrexate and biologic drug X. About 80% of the people, regardless of whether they're on methotrexate or the new drug, do not progress. They do not develop radiographic change. Four out of five people do not get radiographic change. Of the 20% that do get radiographic change, there's more radiographic change in the methotrexate-only group than there is in the biologic group. And that is enough to make the whole groups statistically different. But it obscures the fact that for 80% of people, there isn't, isn't progression anyway. So unfortunately, we are not able to identify the patients at the front end that need the more aggressive treatment. So I think. This, uh, my, my interpretation of this study has shown that, uh, that being aggressive with the old-fashioned oral medicines first is the appropriate way to go. And then after that, we have these other medicines. Well, thank you so much. I, Dr. Brasington actually knows that we give it back to people. In fact, he said that's one of the reasons I came here, <laughs> so, that, so that he could get it back and come back rheumatologic. Ooh. Richard Brazington, 2014, Newstead Lecture, University of Louisville, February 13, wow. 2014. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.